Hi everyone. Thank you very much for joining our Fusan Exchange uh, webinars again. Uh, today, as you might understand, we have this very interesting topic about alternative investments and uh, in that is how we can make use of digital security solving for, you know, for this particular asset class. And we are very happy that today we invite, you know, we are pleased to invite um, Join Nam. Join Nam is the partner at uh, Sydney Austin. She, she is one of the very most well-known uh, lawyers in this space and uh, join us to talk about this topic. And um, so today's agenda, basically, we want to look into this you know, particular uh, asset class uh, in terms of what has been done, you know, or what people are exploring in this asset class in digital asset space and some kind of also in terms of uh, structure or issues or even challenges we have seen so far uh, in, in our, our life, you know, actual life uh, dealing with um, the issues and the projects. So uh, without any uh, further ado, um, why don't we just have, uh, have our, our, our Joy to give a quick introduction on her side first, and then we go to the you know, main discussion for today. Sure. Thanks very much, Kevin, and thanks very much for the invitation to, to join you on uh, the, the weekly webinars. It's a great way to end um, uh, the week. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Joy Lam, as Kevin said, and I'm a partner in the investment funds team at Sidley Austin, based here in Hong Kong. Um, I sit in the fund team, so I really have a focus on formation of investment funds. But, you know, as part of that, a particular area of focus for me certainly is the virtual assets ecosystem. So we've been working very closely now for, for several years with clients who are in the digital segment. Um, and that's covered, you know, helping with the formation of tokenized funds to, you know, advising um, people who want to invest in digital assets on the regulatory landscape, as well as advising on the regulatory issues for um, other, I guess, service providers who are trying to provide the infrastructure to uh, grow the, the virtual assets ecosystem in Asia. Good, right. So I can tell you Joy is a very experienced lawyer in this space because uh, I, I did come across, you know, a couple of projects together with her uh, and um, she is very experienced in this space. So uh, why don't we j just move on to, you know, the topics for today? Okay. Okay, so there are a couple of points we want to talk about for this uh, particular S class in digital space, S uh, space. But first of all, let's, look, you know, look at what is actually happening right now in the asset tokenization space first. Uh, from my experience, you know, Foods and Exchange uh, it's actually, you know, one of the uh, uh, pioneer, I would say, uh, looking into digital asset securitization. Uh, so we come across a couple of, you know, uh, uh, quite a long list of, you know, uh, alternative investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. And indeed, a um, few of our existing investments are already listed on Fusan Exchange. Uh, I would say also classified as alternative investments because they are, one of them are VC fund structure. The other one is more like a, 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 a at fund structure uh, uh, list on the present exchange. So um, I see, you know, the trend from my point of view, of my perspective, uh, because digital asset or security organization probably kicked off uh, three years ago, uh, back to 2017 or 18. Uh, at the time, you know, a, a lot of people are trying to do this organization exercise, but they have to scramble from different parties uh, to get pieces together, right? Uh, if an issuer want to raise money through tokenization exercise, they probably have to go after uh, 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 issuance platform, and they also have to personally go after uh, uh, fundraising uh, 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 intermediaries. Uh, they also have to go after the uh, financial advisor or things like that. But there is no end-to-end -end solution at the time. Uh, so, but in reasoning, I, I do see end-to-end um, -end solution provider. So basically, trying to make this easier for uh, the the issuers uh, to raise money through the financial exercise. Uh, secondly, what I see is um, in the past, you know, this concept is very popular. Uh, uh, actually, it came out from, you know, the Western side of the mm. world, right? And we do see people this coming to the Asian side, like um, fr frankly speaking, the two listing uh, on Tucson Exchange, they actually see an angle to get exposed to Asia and, and they, you know, put their uh, tokens listed on Tucson Exchange. 
looks like you know Asia is also a very important market for them right now. Um, also, you, if people follow this sector, they do see you know regulators, mm -hmm. no matter it is SEC from this from the states or you know um, regulators, even in Hong Kong, they are trying to set up the you know the framework around this area. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and um, DeFi, and of course, this is a very buzzword, a popular buzzword, you know, this year, we see a lot of, you know, tokens because of this, uh, uh, you know, has gone up by, you know, three times, five times, or even 10 times. Uh, but if you look at the substance of the DeFi, right, a lot of them are actually lending activities. So I, 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 I'm not sure whether that will be, you know, at the end of the day, some regulators will come in to look at this as, you know, also asset related or security related activities or organization exercise. Mm -hmm. Lastly, what I see is, you know, the central bank uh, digital currency, um, because if we have a buying currency, which is already digitalized, I can foresee in future, it would make, you know, the, the, the life of asset tokenization or the tokens uh, uh, of business even more uh, 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 easier, I would say, to facilitate the transaction to happen uh, using, you know, our digital currency uh, for uh, tokenization. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know, how do you see it, uh, Joy? <laughs> this is my, yeah. my observation. <laughs> Yeah, look, I think, you know, the, the experience that we've had certainly, I think, is, is pretty consistent with that. I mean, I think despite the fact that particularly here in Hong Kong, you know, we've had a lot of challenges in the last 18 months between, you know, some, some uh, political unrest and then, and then the virus, but, you know, throughout all of that, I think the, the interest that we've been seeing from people who are wanting to explore tokenization and, and other transactions in the kind of digital ecosystem has been very strong. It's been quite robust and it really hasn't been affected, I think, in the same way as we've seen more traditional transactions um, being affected by those sort of macro factors. So I think, you know, there's definitely a lot of interest um, and a lot of eagerness for, for people to, to utilize blockchain and, and really try to give people um, access to, to more assets and also, you know, increase the investor base. So I think, you know, there's definitely a recognition quite generally, fairly broadly, that you know, tokenization really can be utilized to unlock, you know, a new and a wider investor base and, and democratize access to illiquid investments. I mean, I think, you know, to your point about the influence end-to-end solution provider, there certainly um, has been some challenge in, in the sense that, you know, when the service providers are quite fragmented, it's been very difficult for people who want to execute a deal to figure out exactly how to do it because there's just too many different people that they have to deal with. And, you know, because the regulatory framework hasn't been um, really established in a way that is tailored to these kinds of products, it's been quite challenging because if you have an asset and you want to go to investors in Hong Kong as well as Singapore as well as the US, you know, the regulatory requirements in all of those different places are just so, they can be so different. It's very challenging, I think, for people um, to, to figure out how they can actually execute that. So I think, you know, certainly having some um, cohesiveness and some kind of uniformity in terms of service providers and, you know, um, they're definitely having, you know, venues like, like Fusang Exchange where you can um, really meet a number of those objectives, that is certainly going, going to help as well. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, by the way, everyone, um, if you have any questions, don't be shy. You can also type in your questions and we do have a few minutes at the end of the session to answer your questions. Hopefully there could be, you know, some informative session for you at the end of the day. All right. Um, okay, uh, let's move on to the next one. Um, so from my experience, I, frankly speaking, I come from the capital market background. So my understanding of alternative investment in the past is more likely, you know, the hatch fund, real estates, uh, or PE fund, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. Until I really, you know, cover this tokenization, you know, uh, business in the last three years, I see more and more people interested in, you know, uh, trying, trying to securitize, you know, their art, you know, collections or securitize uh, uh, their, 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 their luxury items or even IP rights, all right? Something I, I cannot imagine before, right? How can yeah. you securitize IP rights? 
So from my experience, I, I, I would say, you know, in, in my past, you know, 20 years life, I, I seen, you know, the, the first category, which is, you know, the financial assets. I think mm. to me, this is the alternative assets. Right now, I also see, you know, the second category, which is like a lifestyle collectible uh, uh, assets. People trying to do digital mm. securitization, uh, arts, wines, luxury goods, things like that, right? Uh, I believe, you know, um, uh, 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 joy, you also come across people trying to uh, do such a conversation for horses, right? <laughs> Things like that. Right. Yeah. So very interesting. So yeah. the, the last bit uh, I would say also would be, you know, the intangible, I would say intangible access. So mm. things like IP rights, movies, something you and I also came across before. Uh, mm. Celebrities, you know, in terms of uh, how people are making money out of their cash flows mm. uh, and carbon credits, things like that. So I think this is quite interesting. Also expand my perspective in terms of what alternative investment could be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, I think, you know, the, the use of blockchain really is just opening up such a wide, wide range of, of new asset classes that people probably never really thought about investing in before. Um, I mean, you know, real estate, it, you know, based on what we've seen, like real estate by far is sort of the, the most um, the most common one that we're coming across because obviously it's tangible, you know, everyone, everyone knows that everyone understands it. And it's something that traditionally has always had very um, strong interest in from an investor perspective. But at the other end of the spectrum, we really have seen some um, exotic, I guess you would call them assets, like some of the things that you've um, listed there. But, you know, we've also seen like things like, um, cigars and solar panels and renewable energy. So I think, you know, working in this space, one of the really interesting things really will be to see, like, where, where does it go from here? Like, what are, you know, how much broader, I guess, does the, the horizon um, expand to? And, you know, as a side note, I know that the, the 2020 Knight Frank um, Wealth Report has like a specific section on investing in Hermes handbags. And, you know, I've had people come to me talking mm -hmm. about setting up funds for all sorts of things, but no one has ever come to me to say they want to set up a fund, um, you know, tokenizing investments in Birkin. So if anyone watching today is keen on that, come and speak to me. I'm definitely happy to collaborate on that. <laughs> <laughs> Good for ladies. <laughs> Right, right. Yes, very interesting. Um, it's a good perspective for me to expand my, my understanding as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I come across this transaction on this project. So I basically see some basically pros and cons uh, in terms of alternative investments. From, from my experience, I see, you know, I also come from, you know, portfolio manager background, right? So it, alternative investment is actually good. Uh, 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 addition to traditional investment like stocks or fixed income because the correlation between the traditional investment and alternative investment is less so high so you basically achieve the diversification uh, uh, a risk diversification you know objective and um, also you know to be honest with you some of this alternative investment come with high risk and mm. also they will be high return so mm. there is you know, some kind of equation like this uh, but on the other hand, when, when we look at, you know, alternative investment, one point is very tough um, for people to, to get very comfortable is how to value it, right? Mm -hmm. Unlike stocks, unlike fixed income, fixed income, you, you know, at the end of the day, if after one year, you, you, you just get back your face value, your principal. So this is their valuation. You know, stock, you know how to value it because all these multiples and, and business perspective. But like a hard piece, right? I don't know how, how, how to value, you know, a piece of art to be like a hundred million or 50 million or even just, you know, two dollars. So mm. it's very judgmental and how, and, and whether, you know, when people say I, I, I'm doing the valuation for this art piece, how do you know this person or the valuer is qualified doing this and giving the mm. opinion and, and not only you would take it, but the most importantly is your willing buyer would take it, right? Yeah. Otherwise it, it doesn't work, right? So yeah. this is how I see it is a very important part um, we need to see. Um, yeah. Also, sometimes, you know, the, liqu the liquidity is quite, it's very thin, very thin for, for mm. alternative investment. Um, the, the liquidity for real estate transaction, we can see like in Hong Kong, we see a lot mm. of people like, you know, bricks and uh, mortar, right? Um, the, 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 the transactions are 
we are talking about probably uh, tens of thousands you know, a year. But this kind of liquidity is probably not imaginable in an art piece investment, or right? <laughs> because uh, uh, the, the 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 people education still you know lacking of the education to how to to trade this kind of investment. But this is something you know could, could be some fair go um, for some willing investor to get comfortable with. Uh, yeah. Lastly, I also see because uh, this sector, you know, the um, alternative investment like. Uh, even today, I can tell you, gold, gold is still an unregulated market. Mm. All right. So even gold has been around for a few decades, long, long time, but it is still unregulated. Not to say about art pieces or uh, luxury washes, uh, things like that. So these are, you know, some of the things I, I encounter when people uh, come to me uh, talk about, you know, the uh, this kind of investment. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I yeah, look, I, I think that's right. And, you know, I mean, I think valuation in particular has been quite challenging. And I think, you know, part, part I mean, that is probably one of the reasons why in the in the transactions that we've seen anyway, that we've been working on and talking to people about more of those transactions relate to assets or asset classes where there is some kind of way to independently verify value. So, you know, I mean, real estate is obviously much easier, but even things like whiskey, you know, there is a specific index. And so for, you know, I think some types of assets where there is some kind of benchmark out there that people can use, that makes it a little bit easier. But for other things, um, you know, it can be a, a real challenge. And depending on how that transaction is structured, it can, it really can be a deal breaker because from the investor perspective, you know, it's very difficult for them, I think, to, um, to get comfortable in terms of how those, those um, valuations are, are arrived at, particularly if, you know, it, if it is structured as a fund, perhaps, and there's someone taking a management fee based on the valuation of that, then that makes it just, I think it compounds the difficulty that you have with, um, with valuation for illiquid assets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, So when it comes to structure, right, um, my experience is uh, that different type of, you know, investment structure we can make, mm. but typically it would come under these four categories to me, mm. like, you know, equity tokens, bond tokens, fund tokens, and utility tokens, right? Uh, this is the typical structure. Um, I, I, I would see people trying to do this, but I, I do see people using because when, when we say tokens, right? Tokens, mm -hmm. how, do, how do we tie the tokens to the, uh, to the assets? Mm -hmm. It's something uh, we don't have you know, experience before. Uh, and we do see people using different approach to tie this relationship between the assets and, and the tokens. Like you know, in the very old days, I see people using just contractual agreements or relationship mm -hmm. to tie this to uh, uh, underlying assets uh, to the tokens. And um, to be honest with you, on Fusan Exchange uh, perspective, we, 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 we are more keen to see a direct relationship between the ownership and the token. Mm. And that's why, honestly speaking, our Fusan Exchange, our own tokens, uh, we are using uh, a, 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 a direct uh, token issuance, which replaces the share certificate. So mm -hmm. our shareholders are not taking the share certificate. What they take is uh, share uh, share tokens directly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is a that. So people just get you know ex direct exposure to the uh, equity interest plus whatever mm -hmm. economic interest out of the company. I don't know pr pr probably Joy you are in the more in the legal side. You would come across mm -hmm. more about the structuring issues. Yeah, look, I mean, the, the, you're, you're right. There are a lot of different structures that um, people have, have been considering. I think what you've described in terms of, you know, still having a company, you've got a share, but you've got the token that represents the share rather than, you know, a paper share certificate. I think that by far still has been the most um, common model that people have been using because it's, from an investor perspective and from a regulatory perspective, it's much cleaner, it's much clearer. Everyone, everyone kind of can um, fairly easily understand what we're talking about. But I think the second you talk about like native tokens and it, it gets a bit, um, 
you know, it gets a bit grey and you, you lose some people. But, you know, in terms of the structures that are being considered, I mean, f from a Hong Kong perspective anyway, we've definitely seen um, a lot of people wanting to issue tokens, as you said, that, you know, represent the shares, which represent an ownership interest, or we've seen people wanting to issue tokens which represent shares in a fund because the asset owners like the the ease in which they can really retain control and management through a fund structure. Um, we certainly have seen revenue interest, which I think is point C on your um, your slide where we talk about the contractual economic interest. We have seen um, people wanting to you know have tokens represent like revenue interests also um, ownership interests. In, in relation to, to bonds, um, and I guess, you know, debt in general, we've seen that, but that really has been limited more to real estate. And I think, again, that just goes back to, you know, the, the um, suitability and the, the stability of the underlying asset. But I think in, in terms of like the more exotic asset classes that we're talking about, the, the, the deals that have been structured are, are more looking at either revenue interests or um, equity, like ownership interests, not so much any kind of debt. Um, and I think the only other thing I would add in, in terms of structure is that, you know, up until now, a lot of the transactions that we've seen um, executed or that we've worked on anyway have been using Cayman structures because, you know, Cayman law, um, it's, it's technology neutral, right? And it provides a lot of flexibility for people. And that's why Cayman vehicles have always been so um, popular in, in transactions um, of all kinds, really. Um, but I think what we're seeing is, you know, the Cayman Islands introduced a new regime a couple of months ago for um, what they call virtual asset service providers. And it involves some registration and notification requirements. Um, and in some circumstances, it can include a, a cap, basically, on the total amount that can be raised. And that hasn't actually commenced yet. And, you know, there's still, I think the market in general is waiting for more guidance from the regulator about how exactly that is going to be enforced and when it is going to become effective. But I think, you know, in terms of structures, it will be interesting to see once that actually that regime in the Cayman Islands actually is introduced, it will be interesting to see how that affects structures and whether people start actually moving away from Cayman or whether, you know, it's, it's implemented in a way that can facilitate the continued use of Cayman vehicles. Yes, I agree. Cayman um, structure is um, one of the most popular uh, mm. arrangements people have been using. I, I do, our, our experience with our issuer candidates are also using, a lot of them using Cayman structure. Yeah, very common. So um, maybe this page will be very interesting to our audience because um, to be honest with you, this bunch of you know, uh, our cases here are actual cases that I, I came across on Fusan Exchange. Uh, I believe you know, uh, Joy also came across you know, quite a number of this kind of unit transaction as well. Maybe I'll just pick a few and, uh, mm. on my side and Joy also you can just chip in on your experience of mm. two of them. Uh, the usual suspect, of course, real estate portfolio, right? People want to do tokenization. It's frankly speaking, it's pretty much like RITs or uh, a PE, uh, a traditional PE fund. Mm. We just tokenize the, uh, uh, the the SPV level, like you know, the mm. payment structure, yeah. easy. Um, the other interesting one I came across is Diamond. All right, mm. so there is an issue trying to do um, uh, tokenization around the Diamond. Uh, but when you look at Diamond, Diamond is a little bit different compared to Go because when we say go, we can say this is, you know, fungible asset, because if you want to make, you know, standardized go, you can mail it down and then according to some, you know, standard, make it to 999 uh, 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 go bar, right? And then you have, you know, all this fungible uh, go bar. But diamond, basically, you know, the 4C with diamond, right? they're different clarity, different carrot and different uh, uh, color, whatever, right? So it's really hard to do the standardization of, of, around this asset. But somehow this issue, they find some way to try to do a standardization on, on, on that part. So that is something very interesting to me uh, when I look at the transaction actually. And mm. um, also, you know, this is something uh, I, I come across, I feel very interesting about. Um, the other one is movies. Um, yeah, of course, movie, you can see, uh, movie production is already a business. Why, you know, it is so interesting about alternative, based, uh, alternative investments. 
um, yeah, like you know, Sony movie or MGM, it is mm. it could be you know a business tokenized already or mm. securitized already. But what we see is people also want to tokenize uh, a single movie production. All right, mm. so in in a way that um, they they want to raise money from the token holder. Uh, not only just to share the economics out of that, you know, production, movie production, but also uh, to give them some, you know, additional benefit like a utility token uh, in terms of like uh, people, uh, the token holders can get a chance to go out for, uh, for, for dinner with the celebrities, right? The, the, the actors or the actress, mm-hmm. or they even get, you know, the movie tickets for, uh, for, for, for the opening, you know, uh, uh, display. So mm-hmm. this is, something very interesting we see we can combine you know the uh, economic interest together with some utility uh, function of mm. uh, uh, of the uh, of the transaction mm. the other one is uh, i also came across this art collection right we actually yeah. came across you know a, a few of these art collectors they're trying to tokenize their their, their art collections right they believe um they can even they, one of them is actually a, a museum all right. Also, although it is an NGO type of museum, they, they, they want to see whether they can, you know, uh, do something about, you know, uh, getting some uh, uh, funding through the cash flows uh, or backing of the uh, underlying assets so that they can use the fund to expand, you know, that the museum. So this is something very interesting when, when I come across this transaction like this. Mm. Uh, I believe, Joy, you also have very exciting experience about uh, this transaction. <laughs> Yeah, look, I mean, the 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 uh, the first one we did was was of course, as you know, the the whiskey fund, um, HCS whiskey fund, which closed back in January, um, and you know they're they're expecting to be listed, I think, pretty soon. Um, you know, I think for us, like uh, in terms of funds, right? We before blockchain, before all of this, you know, tokenization stuff became very popular. Um, we had worked on a couple of funds which were focused on. Um, investing in like uh, alcohol, rare wines, things like that. Not many, but, you know, there were sort of the occasional funds that popped up like that. So I think, you know, in some ways, like for us, a fund that's focused on, um, you know, casks of rare whiskey is, you know, obviously quite unique, um, not, not, really, not really that common, um, but in a sense, not a huge leap from some of the things that we had seen before. Um, but, you know, at the end of the other end of the spectrum, I mean, we do have people who are we're actually working at the moment on um, funds which are involving um, racehorses, as we've said. We've got another one that's um, uh, investing in um, cigars. We've got one that's investing in um, artwork, um, one that's investing in like solar panels and renewable energy. So there's just, you know, it's, it's really just such a broad mix of different things. I mean, honestly, the only thing missing is Birkins. So some, some, <laughs> someone needs to someone needs to fill that gap. <laughs> well, we need someone to know how to verify this is a genre yeah. who were Birkin. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> right, 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 right. Very interesting. Um, okay. Uh, well, given the time, I, I I should move faster. Sorry about that. Um, no. So I think I also cover a bit of this concern mm. before. Um, so basically, we see some transaction. They 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 don't tie the equity interest to the economic interest, all right, even though it is a secret token. Uh, most importantly, the second point is people's understanding. I think a lot of investors still do not quite understand basically the underlying assets, not to mention about tokenization, right? Yeah. So that that is another layer, you know, uh, a blockage to them to, to, to yeah. make an investment in this space. Uh, valuation concern we just mentioned, uh, apparently price volatility, this is, you know, this kind of assets class put subject to high price volatility. And the counterparty risk, like, you know, because it's an unregulated, you know, uh, a territory. So the counterparty risk could be quite high. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything to add, uh, Joy? Uh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, look, def- definitely agree on those, particularly on the um, education point. I mean, I think, you know, I had a conversation just today with someone um, about, you know, tokenization and, and he literally, his response was, so you mean cryptocurrencies, right? And I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Yep. Tokenization does not necessarily mean cryptocurrency. So there's definitely, you know, a lot of work to be done in terms of educating people and, you know, making them understand that, you know, tokenization of blockchain does not necessarily mean cryptocurrencies and ICOs. So I think, you know, for, for a lot of people, there is still that kind of negative 
um, connotation, which, you know, there, there's a bit of work, I think, to be done in terms of um, addressing that concern. And I think the only other thing really is, you know, the, the lack of a um, cohesive um, regulatory framework in, in various jurisdictions is also a bit of a challenge. Um, you, you know, if you're, if someone's wanting to, to tokenize an asset and they're just looking at investors in one jurisdiction, you know, that, I guess that's easy enough. But the second you talk about, you know, cross-border multiple jurisdictions or assets in one jurisdiction, investors in another, you know, maybe a manager in a third, it becomes much more challenging in terms of navigating that regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. Agreed, I totally agree. Uh, okay, maybe just move on to the last slides. Um, so from my perspective, um, like, you know, this is high risk, high return yeah. type of, you know, asset class. So investor or even on the issue side, they, they want to do this exercise. They should have done, you know, their own homework before they make a decision on that. And of course, you know, in any case, you should ask expertise uh, advice, you know, so yeah. that whether to, to conduct this transaction. Uh, and um, I, I would also suggest, you know, the other is you, you go find an end-to-end -end solution provider because mm -hmm. this like um, uh, very piecemeal type of task you have to get together until yeah. you get to the end point. That is not uh, something very easy for you. So uh, go after something which already can provide you one stop source solution. Yeah. Anything yeah. to add? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, look, I, I agree with those points. I mean, definitely having, you know, the, the right service providers and, and people who um, obviously know what they're doing, but also are able to kind of, um, you know, meet as many of those functions as possible. Because, uh, you know, as, as you said, having to deal with different, different um, people for, for different functions just incurs a lot of time and, and additional cost, which, you know, kind of defeats the purpose, I guess, of, in some ways, of wanting to adopt blockchain. Um, and definitely, you know, in terms of like doing research and, and getting advice, like structuring is, is really key to making sure that, you know, you're not wasting a lot of time exploring some option only to find that at the end, you, you can't do it because, you know, for whatever reason, it could be regulatory, it could be tax, it could be something else. So I think, you know, definitely doing the, the research and the groundwork up front to really understand exactly what the structure should be and whether or not that actually meets the commercial objective is very important. All right, okay, good, good. Um, we come to the end, thank you very much. We come to at the end of you know, this, this session. I know we overrun for a few minutes, few minutes already. Um, why don't we, because we also see a, quite a number of you know, questions coming into, uh, into this uh, Q&A uh, uh, window. Why don't we just answer like you answer one question, I answer one question before we close sure. this uh, session. Uh, maybe I go first. Um, there's a, you know, uh, an audience asking why was the advantage of this company shares against tokens instead, you know, using tokens instead. To me, I, I, I'm a true believer of the uh, transition of paper-based capital market to the token-based capital market. Because to be honest with you, even though we are saying online digital trading, but why we are still encountering T plus two for settlement. There's no way for T plus two, unless, you know, there's some stakeholder want to keep the, you know, funding for two days, all right? Um, so in this efficient world, we should be able to settle the transaction immediately. And in addition, when we say token, the smart contract, besides the efficiency for settlement, we have an additional benefit of doing compliance. Like, you know, if you have, uh, 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 you don't want mainland Chinese investors uh, uh, to, uh, uh, um, to buy this transaction. You can actually put this, you know, uh, con conditional restraint or uh, constraint mm -hmm. into your smart contract. And whenever you come across this type of investors, the token would never be able to go to the wallet of that, you know, mainland Chinese mm -hmm. investors. So this is something we, we, we see it should be driving the capital market going forward in the future. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, just, this question maybe for joy there's a question actually going to after you <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, yeah you you see that question um uh, hang on. it's about hesitation what, what what hesitation do you usually encounter from your clients in terms of making a decision to tokenize their assets Good question. I mean, I, you know, it's, there's certainly not just one, but, you know, definitely one of the challenges that people are really struggling with, particularly um, here in Hong Kong, is, 
you know, distribution. So, you know, a lot of people are wanting to, like a lot of asset owners want to tokenize their assets because, you know, they're really wanting to fundraise. And at the moment, um, although the regulatory framework is in place, you know, we don't have anyone here in Hong Kong who has the relevant licenses who can help with distribution of um, these security tokens. So that's definitely been, um, I think, you know, one of the challenges. I think there's a lot of people who want to do it, but some parts of the ecosystem maybe aren't as developed as they need to be to really support the full amount of um, fundraising that they're, they're hoping to achieve. So I think, you know, distribution, liquidity, um, which in a way goes back to a number of other factors, including, you know, like the regulatory framework and, you know, maybe a, a smaller participant base. But I think, you know, that that's definitely kind of very front of mind for clients because from their perspective, they're not going to do the transaction if they can't actually achieve their commercial objective, which usually is to raise capital. All right. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so sorry about, you know, being late for like six minutes, if I look at my <laughs> watch correctly. Um, but today is very informative and very constructive. And, you know, I, I also pick up a lot of points from, you know, a joy uh, from uh, because of her experience in this space. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your time and you know participating in this uh, webinar together with me uh, and talking about your experience in this space. Um, so I hope you know for our audience, this is you know a very con uh, uh, educational and, and informative session for you. We mm -hmm. hope you know going forward we can bring you more this type of uh, uh, webinars or topics uh, uh, for your information. Thank you very much for attending today. Thank, thank you, Joy. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.